morning if you'd open to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Gospel of John, chapter 5. I said already it's good that we can come today and uh, be in God's house again. And we're thankful for the members that are here today. I know there's some that are out due to sickness. We're thankful that uh, those of you that are here were able to be here. And we're thankful for the visitors that are here. We're always glad to have visitors. And so we are very thankful that you have chosen to come this morning. And it's my desire that we'd always make you feel welcome. And uh, most of all, that you could feel the presence of the Lord in the service this morning. John chapter 5. I'm going to read just two verses down toward the end of this chapter. And uh, not going to deal necessarily with what led to this. Just suffice it to say this, that uh, Brother Stephen Webb in our revival mentioned, there, at least he preached a message maybe Thursday night from the beginning part of this chapter. And uh, you'd, most of you would be familiar with a man that had, was lame for 38 years and he was at the pool of Bethesda. And that Jesus came along, he asked him, wilt thou be made whole? And uh, that, that man uh, was told to rise, take up his bed and walk. And of course that he had, had to come to the place that he put his trust in nothing else. And uh, he was helpless. And yet he believed what Jesus Christ told him. And so that day that he was made whole, that very hour. And uh, that stemming from that is the rest of this chapter. And really what it deals with is the fact that the Jews, and I'm not going to go into great detail concerning them this morning. Suffice it to say just they were very religious people, but not spiritual people because they didn't know Jesus Christ. They hadn't trusted in Jesus Christ. On the whole, he came to his own, and you know, on the whole, his own received him not. To them that did, to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even them that would believe on his name. But on the whole, they had rejected him, at least at this time, and, and, and on, they still, as a whole, reject Christ, even though there's a remnant to this day. But uh, they began to criticize not only Jesus for healing this man on the Sabbath day, but for the man for taking up his bed, the cot that he would lay on and he took that and he got up and he walked with that and to them that their man-made regulations that that was something that was taboo to do on the Sabbath day. And uh, from that, that Jesus began in verse 19, and I'm not going to read back to verse 19, but you can go back if your Bible has the words of Christ in red, you can go back and you can see that the rest of this chapter, you want to just put it, it's a message that Jesus Christ is going to preach uh, to these people and uh, that there's many things that he is going to say. But toward the end of this chapter, he is going to uh, give many evidences that testify that he is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God. And I don't want to deal with all those things this morning, uh, but I do have a burden this morning for those of you who may be here and have never trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm going to say it this way, that uh, I guess I haven't just struggled with a message as I have the message this morning in a long time. And I feel like the reason is, at least part of the reason, is because of the seriousness of the message. That uh, I knew about middle of the week, the Lord put a thought on my heart. And uh, as I began to think about that, meditate on that, and ponder on that, I, I knew it was a very serious thought. And so that uh, because it's a very serious thought, that I, I know that it's not me that does the work. Uh, but, you know, it was my desire by, by all means to to know the direction the Lord would want me to go and to preach it in a way that would please Him. And so that, uh, as I said, I've struggled over this. I've, 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 uh, I've wept over this. I've, 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 I've toiled over this. And uh, it's my desire today that the Lord could use it. Not because it's me, but because I know that I believe that there's, there's someone here today that would need to hear it. Let's go down to verse 39 of this chapter is where I want to read. Read two verses of Scripture, verses 39 and 40. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. And I just want to read those two verses. Now, remember, I said some things just a minute ago for a reason. I said that Jesus was speaking here to religious people. He was, he was speaking to people that every Sabbath day that they observed the Sabbath, they would go to the temple and pray. They would bring the sacrifices that they felt like they needed to bring. And uh, there was one reason for, those, for that. There was a reason they did all the things that they did. And I want to read these two verses again, and I'm going to ask you a question, and, 
uh, j just read them along, you know, silently to yourself as I read them again. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. Now, if I were to ask each one of you that are here this morning, just in maybe two words, if you could sum up these, the main thought of these two verses of Scripture, what would you tell me? I think it's very plain and very evident here that the main thought, the main point of these two verses of Scripture is eternal life. He said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He said, but there, you know, in essence what he's saying was that the Scriptures that you're, uh, you're trying to live by, they're all talking about the fact you can't uh, live up to those things, that you fail in those things, and that you've got to look to me. And then he said, but you won't come to me that you might have life. Now let's deal with these, these religious people for just a minute. Don't want to take all our time this morning uh, dealing with them. But what were they searching for? They were searching for the right thing. Eternal life. Now what Jesus said, I read it or quote it again, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. In other words, the reason that you're doing what you're doing is because that you're, in a, you're on a quest, you have a desire to have eternal life. You know that there's a, a load of guilt that you carry. You know that you're a sinner. You know that you're separated from God. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that eternal life. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You can find when man was separated from God. And ever since that time, that man has done many different things trying to find peace with God. Have they not? What are they looking for? I say they're looking for peace with God. They're looking for eternal life. They're looking to be, you know, reconciled back to God. And so these people knew that they needed eternal life. And that's why that they were searching the scriptures. So they knew they needed eternal life. That was a good thing. And where did they go to find the answer for how they obtained eternal life? For the Adrian, they, they went to the scriptures. I know that Jesus, I, I know there's two different schools of thought. Those first three words, search the scriptures. Some say that Jesus was saying, he was commending them and he's saying that you, you do search the scriptures. I, I feel like it was a command that he's given there. You need to go back and search them again is really what I believe he's saying. That you've searched the scriptures, that you spent a lot of time in the scriptures. And he's talking about the Old Testament, obviously, because the New Testament was not written at that time. But he said, you need to go back and look at them again. You need to, re you need to go back through the scriptures. You need to search them again. Because that you think that you have eternal life. So they were seeking eternal life. That was good. They were seeking eternal life in the right place. Because really, in actuality... There's only one that can tell us how to obtain eternal life, and that's God. I'm shocked today at the responses that people give when they're asked about how eternal life is obtained. I think a lot of us are naive, aren't we? Because our little group, for the most part, People who know the Lord, Jesus Christ as their Savior. A lot of those are people that attend church. Whether they're saved or not, at least a lot of people in, you know, in our circles have gone to church. They know how to be saved. They know it's Jesus Christ. But when you get out in the world, it'll blow your mind at what people say that is necessary to gain eternal life. Uh, a lot of it's based on what they read by best-selling authors, isn't it? better be careful the books you read. I'm not going to give you a list of authors. I don't want you to read. That's none of my business. But be careful. You be careful because you make sure that what they're saying matches up with the Scriptures. That's why God's given us the Scriptures. The Scriptures are a divine revelation of God's plan and purpose for mankind, is it not? And so that these people were not looking, they were not looking for eternal life in philosophers. They were not looking for eternal life in some sort of psychology or philosophy or mythology or any of these other things. Not even in idolatry, so to speak. That Israel had been involved in idolatry in the Old Testament, but by this time they had sort of cast that aside. 
They were looking forward in the scriptures in the divine revelation uh, of, of God, of himself, that he's given uh, to mankind. But they missed it. They missed it. He said, you need to go back and search it again because in them, in doing all the things that you do, in the outward appearance, in your actions, in your deeds, he said, in all of these things, you think you have eternal life. But in essence, what he's saying is you're wrong. Because he said all the scriptures point to one man. And that's the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let's take our thought from verse 40 this morning. He said, and you will not come to me that you might have life. You see, they missed the fact that, that Christ is the great theme of the scriptures, isn't he? From the very beginning. My goodness. When God took coats of skins and he clothed Adam and Eve in the garden, that's a picture of Christ. And from then, all the way through the scriptures, what you see is Christ. He's personified in a lot of different ways. He's pictured in a lot of different ways. He's pictured in a lot of different people. He's pictured in the sacrifices. He's pictured in the tabernacle. He's, he's pictured in the, in, the, in, the, in the law, the prophets, all of those. The, the picture of Jesus Christ is there. But he said, you won't come to me that you might have life. He said here that eternal life is only found in coming to Jesus Christ. This morning, if you want to title the message, and this is why it's so serious to me this morning. The title of the message this morning is just coming to Christ. That's what I'm going to preach about today is coming to Christ. Could you think of anything better that a person could do to, than to come to Christ? You, you ever hear people make that statement that, Maybe there's an invitation given and maybe an evangelist would say, you need to come to Christ. Come to Him. Turn verse 40 around. Let's look back at that verse. He said, you will not come to me that you might have life. Turn it around. What's he saying? To have life, you must do what? Come to me. But he said, you won't do it. So to come to Christ, the only way that an individual can have eternal life is to come to Christ. So this morning, if you're here and you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're lost. The Bible uses that term, it's to be lost. Why are you lost? Because you've not come to Christ. That's the only reason you're lost. I'm not talking about physically coming to Him. Jesus Christ today is at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding on our behalf. He's our great high priest. I don't believe it's going to be long till he's going to leave there and he's going to come in the clouds. And the last trump's going to sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and we that are alive and remain. I said we that are alive and remain. Paul thought he would come in his lifetime. I think he's going to come in my lifetime. If he does it, then the next generation that comes along that are believers believe he's coming in their lifetime. We know he's coming. Don't let the fact that he's not come yet, uh, don't, don't let that deceive you. The Bible says in the book of 2 Peter that there's many that doubt today. They're scoffers. They say, well, he's not come yet. He's not coming at all, but he's coming. He's just allowing, other, he's allowing time for other people to be saved. But Christ is going to come, and he's going to rapture his people out of this world. And then certainly that there's much that he is, is going to do after that. But right now he's at the right hand of the Father. So... What does it mean to come to Christ? The next few minutes, I want to take some scriptures. And with the help of the Lord, I want to try to persuade you to come to Christ. Notice, I, I, can't, I can't persuade you to come to Christ. I don't have that power and ability within me. But I said I want to take the scriptures and try to persuade you. Because I know this, that it's through the preaching of the gospel that God's chosen to save them. That believe. So I, I, I plead with you this morning to, to if, you're, if, you're, if you're lost or you're saved, open your Bible and look at these scriptures that we're going to deal with for just a few minutes this morning. And I beg you and plead with you today, before you leave here, would you come to Christ? Would you come to Him? What does it mean to come to Christ? Go back to just a few chapters, back to chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. John chapter 3. A lot of the verses we're going to look at is right here in this particular Gospel. But to come to Christ, that's what I did many years ago. I came to Christ. Everyone that's here this morning that's saved, that they, there's a time in their life that they came to Christ. 
Notice I didn't say they came to the, the preacher or came to the church or came to the baptismal waters, but they came to Christ. John chapter 3, verse 36. So what does it mean when he said that you won't come to me, that you, that you might have life? So what does it mean to come to Christ? Well, he said here in verse 36 of John chapter 3, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So he said, you will not come to me that you might have life. So he's saying that life is obtained by coming to, to Christ. And so here he just used a little different terminology. You say, preacher, what, you know, again, what, what does it mean to, to come to him? If that's all it takes, then, then I'll come to Christ. Well, he, I would encourage you to do that. But he said, he that believeth on the Son, to come to Christ means to believe on him. That's what it means to come to him. It means to trust him. It means uh, to put your faith in him. It means to acknowledge Him as the Savior, as the one that God sent into this world so that we could be saved from our sin. To trust Him. To come to Him. He that, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, unless, I, I'm going to change a word in this verse. I'm not changing the Scripture. But I'm trying to relate it back to where, what He said. He said, you won't come to me that you might have life. Let's read the verse again, verse 36. He that cometh to the Son hath everlasting life. Is that not what he's saying? He that believeth on him hath... If, if, if to come to him means that you have life, it means to believe on him. So he that cometh to the Son hath everlasting life. And he that cometh not to the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. That's a, that's a present tense. It's already abiding on him. If you have not come to Christ, the wrath of God abideth on you. And uh, the wrath of God is the uh, most severe wrath that ever could abide on an individual. So to come to Christ, go back to verse 16 of this same chapter. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, let's read that verse. He said that, that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever cometh to Him, cometh to believe in Him, whosoever would come, come to Him, whosoever would believe in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What does it mean to believe on the Son of God? Well, it just simply means to accept Him as your Savior. It means to come to the place to trust Him with your eternity. To believe what God said. To put it in His hands. Go over to chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. John chapter 20. <clears throat> the, last verse, the last two verses of this chapter. John's giving a summary of why that he wrote what he did. Of course, he writes it under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, no doubt. Every word's God breathed, the Scripture tells us. But notice what he said. He said in verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. This is John chapter 20, verse 30. Which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Again, read it that way of coming to him. That These are written that you might come to Jesus and accept him as the Christ, the Son of God. And that coming to him that you might have life through his name. You see, to come to Christ is to acknowledge the fact that I'm a sinner. And I can't do anything on my own to save myself. But I know what Jesus did for me. I know what Jesus Christ did for me on Calvary. His blood was shed for me. And so now that I, I'm, I'm coming to him and I'm just, I'm leaving behind anything that I can do and I'm just coming to him and trusting what he's done. He said the one that would do that, the one that would come to him, the one that would believe, he said that he would have life. He would have life. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Coming to Christ. 
There's an example that Jesus gives here, I believe is a wonderful example of how the sinner must come to Christ. So if this is you today, if you're the one that's lost, if you know that I'm the one that the message is to this morning, would you listen? Would you take heed? Would you be obedient? Matthew chapter 23, in verse 37, Jesus said this, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often will I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. I want you to notice the example that Jesus gives here. He compares coming unto him as what, as what biddies or chicks do when they go to their mama. Why would Jesus use an example like this? Could you think of just any more nasty animals than old chicken? You say, they're pretty good. They taste good. They do taste good. They stink. You ever cleaned one? they nasty. Why would Jesus use an example such as this? I believe it's because of the simplicity of it. It's so simple that when you, when a, when a hen, when she, when she would hatch out those eggs and those baby chicks would be born, and especially those that would be outside and maybe not be in a cage, as, as she would begin to teach them, she has to teach them everything. She has to teach them to eat. She has to teach them to drink. And you'll notice, what do they do? They follow her, don't they? And you'll see that hen out there and she'll be pecking and picking out in the yard and scratching around and trying to find food for them and, and some of them may have drifted off but in a minute she'll make a sound if she senses danger she makes a sound and what do those little bitties do as fast as their little feet can move they come to mom and what does she do she'll, she'll squat down and she'll stretch her wings out and it's amazing how many little bitties can get under the wings of one mama. And they'll disappear under there, won't they? Every once in a while you might see a little head peek out. Pick out. But why did Jesus use this example? It's because of the obedience that those little, those little bitties, those little chicks, when that mama, when she makes that call, and that call that they know that there's danger... They know I've got, I've got no way to defend myself. There's nothing that I can do to save myself. There's nothing I can do to get away. And I'm going to go immediately and I'm going to get under her wings. And I'm going to trust in her. And I'm going to tell you, for that little chick, the biggest line on the African savannah would not, be, would not cause fear, would they? Because they're under mama. Jesus said, that's how I want you to come to me. That when I call, that you realize that I'm helpless. That there's absolutely nothing I can do in myself. And I'm going to come to Christ. He said, I would have gathered thee as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. But notice what was the statement. You wouldn't come. That's the only reason that they were going to face the wrath of God is because they wouldn't come. The only reason that men, women, boys, and girls are going to face the wrath of God is because that they won't come to Christ. They won't come trusting in Christ as their Savior. They want to do it their way. They want to have their own plan. He said, you just got to come to me. Have you come to that place in your life that you realize that I, I don't have any hope for eternity. There's no way I can get to God on my own. That's what a sinner's got to do. That God's made a way. Jesus built the bridge. That's a good way to look at it. Jesus is the bridge from man to God. And to come to him by faith is the only way that you can get to God. Go back to John chapter 6. So to come to Christ means to believe on Jesus Christ, to trust Jesus Christ. Now who can come to Christ? Let's deal with that question for a minute. Who can come to Christ? Let me 
In John chapter 6 and verse 44, the answer is given to us here. You may say, Preacher, well, can, can I come to Christ? Can I have this eternal life that you're talking about? Can I have this peace? Can I have this assurance? Well, here's the answer. Verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me. I'm glad the verse doesn't stop there. No man can come to me except, in other words, there is a way. And that is that the Father which hath sent me would draw him. So no man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, knows what he does. But wait, it said he comes. Today, do you need to come to Christ? Can you come to Christ? He said you can come to Christ if you're being drawn to Him by the Father. You say, well, how do I know if I'm drawn? It's to realize you're lost. It's to realize that there's something going on within me. God's, he's calling me. He's drawing me to His Son. Now, the word draw there does not mean to drag. Kendall and I were in the cow lot one day, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I had a, a baby that had been born, and I wanted to take the baby and the mama across the road to some better pasture. And I got the mama in the lot, or in the small lot, where the head shoot is, and uh, the baby was still out in the bigger lot. And he was a, I don't know, he was a couple of weeks old. And uh, trying to herd one calf is about impossible if you ever tried to do that. They just don't herd very well when they're that age. And so I ended up doing, I ended up pinning him up in the corner. And when I, when I got him in the corner, I grabbed him and I flipped him on the ground and I picked his legs up and I just drug him all the way in to where his mama was. God's never going to do that to you. He's not going to pick you up and drag you to Christ. So what does it mean that he'll draw all men unto me? That word is, it really means a gracious allurement is what it means. That God in his great love that he is going to draw you to Christ. That I love you and I, I, I desire that you have eternal life and I want you to come and I want you to trust my son as your savior. That's what it's talking about here. It's a spiritual attraction. And that drawing comes to all men. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up from the earth that I'll draw all men unto me. I'll draw them. So who can, who can come to Christ? All those who are drawn of God. And I'm glad, I just quoted you the verse, that all men are drawn. God doesn't pick some out to save and some out to just be lost. But he draws all. And notice what it says in verse 45. This is a key verse. That's why I read it. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man will be drawn to Jesus Christ. But here's the key. Every man, therefore, that hath heard. Who has heard? Let's stop for just a minute. Who has heard? Who's been drawn? All have been drawn. But look, let's read on. Every man that hath heard and hath learned. Hath learned. That means that he has listened, he's paid attention, and he has been convinced. He's got it. He's received the lesson that I'm lost and my only hope's in Christ. He's heard and he's learned. He said now that he's going to come to Christ. So who can come to Christ? Those that are drawn of God. All are drawn to God. At some point in your life that you're drawn to Jesus Christ by the Father. John chapter 7, he puts it a little different way in verse 37. I'm trying to be very simple this morning. John chapter 7, verse 37. <clears throat> being lost is described different ways in the scriptures, but I don't know that there's a better way to describe being lost than what we have in this verse of scripture. John chapter 7, verse 37. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. Remember, we're talking about coming to Christ. He said, you won't come to him that you might have life. Jesus says, now if any man thirst, let him come unto me. And he said, he can have what he's desiring. He can drink. 
He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So who can come to Christ? Those that are drawn to Christ by the Father. How do you know that you're lost? He said it's a thirst. It's a thirst. It's a longing inside. It's something that can't be quenched any other way. It's that inward longing of the soul. He said, if any of you thirst, if any of you realize that I don't have what I need and I can't find it anywhere else, he said, you just come on to me. And he said, I will give you living water. That's what he told that woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said, I have what you need. If you'll take this that I'll give you, you'll never thirst again. So he said, here, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Is there anybody thirsty this morning? I'm not talking about a physical thirst. Is anybody thirsty? I don't try to make predictions about who's lost and who's saved. But I would just imagine in the audience the size of what we have this morning, there's somebody here that's thirsty. And it may be that you've taken drinks from many different things in the world and you've tried, tried to satisfy that thirst, but that's the love of God and the mercy of God that it can't be satisfied in those things. That's God letting you know that you still are lost and that thirst can only be satisfied with coming to the living water. Are you thirsty? He said, come unto me and drink. I'm just I'm not going to turn to it. I'm going to quote it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I think everybody can hear it could quote it. What did Jesus say there in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28? He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What is that load? It's that load of sin. To know that I'm, hey, I've, I've transgressed God's law. I'm, I'm a sinner. I've been disobedient to God. And I tell you, that's a heavy load to carry. And the Jews were laboring, trying to get out from under that load by doing all sorts of things that they could do. By keeping the law. Trying to keep it. By doing good. But he said, you're not going to get out from under it that way. He said, the only way you're going to get out from under it is you're going to have to come to me. He said, come to me. Go to verse 37 of John chapter 6, right behind, or right in front of where we just were. So what does it mean to come to Christ? It means to believe and to trust Jesus Christ. Who can come to Christ? All that are in need, all that thirst. All those that are lost, all those that are being drawn by God. I want to ask you one more question. How can you know that Christ will receive you when you come to him? How can I know that if I come to Him believing that He died for me and trusting in that, how can I know that He'll receive me? Well, I'm glad I don't just have to say, well, just take my word for it. But we find here in verse 37 of John chapter 6, Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I want to focus on the second part of this verse, and him that cometh to me, you see, this morning, the hymn put your name in that place. I put my name there. If Brent will come to me, he said, I will in no wise cast him out. This is neat. There's inc incorrect grammar that's used in this verse of Scripture. No, the Bible's not incorrect. The incorrect grammar that's used here is a double negative. Your parents ever get on to you as a kid for using a double negative? I'm not never going to do it anymore. You don't say I'm not never going to do it anymore. I'm not ever going to do it anymore. There's a double negative in this verse of Scripture. When he said, I will in no wise cast them out, in no wise means no never. You see, it's for emphasis. You see, God wanted you to know this morning that if you'll come to Christ... You'll find eternal life. You'll find salvation. You'll find peace. If you'll come. Come like those, those biddies do. Come like those chicks do. Come realizing that I can't do it. There's no other way I can get, be saved. There's no other way I can find what I'm looking for. I'm just going to have to come to him. He said, never, no, never. He said, well, I cast away or cast out one who comes to me. So how can I know that Christ will receive me? Because he promised. 
he would. Romans chapter 10, he said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, that's assurance. So let's go back to where we started, verse 40. John chapter 5, in closing this morning. Having said all that I said, looking at those scriptures we looked at this morning, let's look at this verse one more time. He said, and you will not come to me that you might have life. I'm glad that the third word in that verse is not can. I'm glad he didn't say, and you cannot come to me that you might have life. He said, it's a choice, it's a decision, it's an act of your will. He said, you will not come to me. You will not come to me. This morning, if the Lord's drawing you, if God's drawing you to his Son as your Savior, the difference is going to be whether or not you will come. It's not going to be whether or not you can come because we've established whosoever will may come. But he said, the fact is that the reason that you've not received eternal life is because he said, you've not come. You know what you need to do. You know I will accept you, but you will not come. What did he say about those that will not come? He said in John chapter 3, they're condemned already. Very quickly this morning, let me remind you, and I don't try to work on your emotions. I don't, I don't believe in that. Let's say just for a minute that you don't come to Christ. You have the opportunity and you, just, you don't come, you choose not to come. Not to accept Him as your Savior. You'll do it your way, you'll do it later, whatever the case might be. And something happens to you and your life ends. I don't have any hope for you. There's no good news I can give you. Because the Bible says this, that those that die without Jesus Christ, having not come to Him, if they lift their eyes in a place called hell, a place of torments, eternal torments, flames. No matter what you may have heard, and I couldn't believe, I, preached, I taught a lesson back earlier this month at a preacher's Bible study about the reality of hell. And I was shocked when I began to research the percentage of people in this country that believe that hell is not a real place. I couldn't believe it, Brother Allen. I'm talking about a quarter of Baptists said they didn't even believe in hell. Where does that put everybody else? Whether you believe it or not, hell's a real place. And it's a place, you talk about black holes, something you enter into and don't ever leave. That's how hell is. You enter into it and there's no opportunity to ever depart from it, ever have, a, uh, ever have an opportunity to leave. And it's a place of literal fire. It's a place where your conscience is never, never ceases to exist. It's a place where you'll always feel the flames. It's a place where you'll pay on your sin debt for eternity. But Christ already suffered all of those things for you. And that's why that God says, just come to my son and you can be saved. So what happens if I don't come to Christ? Well, hell awaits you. You say, well, one day hell is going to be cast in the lake of fire. Brother Joe Michael, I can't find much difference between hell and the lake of fire as far as the description of it. I know hell is temporary and the lake of fire is eternal. The conditions are the same. This morning in closing, I want to turn to the last invitation that's given in the scriptures. It's in Deuteron uh, Deuteronomy, Revelation chapter 22. I've read this many times. I'm going to read it again. It's the last invitation given in the scriptures. And it may be that this is the last invitation that you'll receive. I, I don't know that. But one day, there'll be a last invitation. And so this morning, how important is it you come to Christ? It's the last thing that's given to us in the Bible.
He said in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that's a thirst, he, Come on, come. I love that. Just come. And whosoever will, let him take this water of life freely. What is the water of life? It's Jesus Christ. He said, if you're thirsty, just come to me. And he said, you can have it. You can literally have it. It's just as simple as there was a glass of water up here and you were dying of thirst. And that water would save you. All you had to do is just come and take hold of it and drink it. That's what Jesus said. You come to me. He said, you just come take the water of life freely. You can't buy it, see? You're not, you don't have enough money to buy it. But he that hath no money, come. Come to the waters. This morning, would you come to Christ? I beg you and plead with you. Come to him. How do you do that? You do it in your heart. You do it by just accepting him. I wouldn't try to put words in your mouth. That'd be foolish. But it's just to come to the place that I know Jesus died for me. And I know that if I'll trust him, God said he'd save me. And you do that. If you do that, would you make it known this morning? Let's have a verse of a song. The Lord's calling you.